Amen. So, if you have been tracking with us for a little while now, we, um, we've reached an interesting number of, of, of weeks we've been going through, through um, this gospel according to Matthew. 40 weeks? 40 weeks in the gospel of Matthew. And um, we know that 40 is, is a very significant number in the Bible, right? And so um, a number of trials, <laughs> testing. <laughs> so I hope that today is, isn't going to be trials and testing for some of us, but maybe it, sh- it will be. And some of the trials and the tests of the Lord are not always bad. I mean, the 40 years in the wilderness wasn't a good thing, but Jesus conquering Satan in the wilderness was a good thing, right? So, um, so yeah. So, yes, we are here, and we're going through this gospel according to Matthew, as I said, and the gospel is good news. So when we look at the, the, the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's good news. It's good news because God's done something, what we should be glad about. And so as we've been going through this good news account, we have continually seen how Jesus meets the credentials to be Messiah. His genealogy, which we took some time to look through, all points to him being the promised one, the chosen one. His unusual birth gives us the proof that he is Messiah. He has the forerunner, John the Baptist, fulfilling Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. The place of his birth, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. We see that Jesus had an unusual baptism because at Jesus' baptism, we read that the spirit descended and rested upon him, remained upon him like a dove. And then we had the voice of the father from heaven declaring, this is my son, my beloved son. So basically the 30 years of silence, which we don't really know much about Jesus, the father is affirmed. All those 30 years, which you don't know about, guess what? He gets the tick. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. We see how, we've seen how, sorry, Jesus was victorious in his tests in the wilderness. And then we've seen how he has given us his teachings, which we looked at chapter five, six, and seven. And how Jesus went up a mountain to declare the new law very reminiscent of Moses who went Mount Sinai and received the law. And so there's these parallels which Matthew is giving to us. And we've seen how, so we've seen Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. And then Jesus came down from the mountain and we looked at his works, his words and his works. Because he's claiming to be Messiah, he's claiming to be king, and the king has to have power, right? You can't be much of a king, you've got no power. So he's declaring, hmm, talk is cheap, but I can back up my talk. And so, Jesus demonstrates that he must be Messiah because only God can do the very things which Jesus did and Jesus continues to do. And so as Jesus done all these things, all these things were basically validating who he was But his first coming was also validating the second coming. Because if he could do all these things now, then, then he has the credentials to do those things in the future. So it's all validating the surety of the second coming. That Jesus could indeed reverse the curse. I thought you'd like that, Soros. Reverse the curse. You probably used it before, but you know. I thought of you. So we've seen how Jesus came down from the mountain and what Matthew does, and he doesn't necessarily do it in chronological order, but Matthew sets out nine miracles of Jesus and the subsequent or the ensuing responses of those miracles. So he heals the leper, we saw a couple of weeks ago. He healed the centurion servant. How? With a 
the word, right? I'm just going to make sure you're with me today. So he, said, he spoke the word, right? But he touched the, the leper. He shouldn't have touched the leper. But he's God, right? So he can do that stuff. I'm God, I can do that. I'm not going to be defiled. I'm going to make the leper clean. So he speaks forth the word and then he heals Matthew's mother-in-law because the disciples wanted to eat Sunday dinner, Saturday dinner, Sin Sabbath dinner. Sabbath dinner? Right, anyway. So he heals Matthew's mother-in-law and she gets up and she serves him. Amen? We saw that. And then it says in verse 16, you're referring to Matthew chapter 8, when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed and he cast out the spirits. How? With a word. And he healed all who were sick. How many? All, all who were sick. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4. He himself took our infirmities and bore our sickness. Hallelujah. Isaiah said, I think it's roughly 700 years before, that Messiah will do this stuff. That's what Messiah will do. He'll be able to heal sickness. And so this is another way in which we could recognize, well, who's this Messiah? Wow, he's going around healing people. He was born in Bethlehem. He has the right genealogy. You get the picture. All these things affirming who Jesus is. And it should have affirmed to Israel exactly who Jesus was, is, because he is, right? And so, Matthew's writing this account to encourage those who would read on afterwards that, look, this is the Messiah. And the crowds followed Jesus, and they followed Jesus with their varying needs and varying motivations. exciting this guy's going around casting out demons with a word get out of him get out of her and the demons fled healing everyone around it's like what's going on here i want a piece to the action i want to get excited what's going on they're following jesus but as they followed just like all of us in this room we follow with different needs different motivations and so it says in verse if you're there in Matthew 18, Matthew 8, verses 18, please say amen. amen. And when Jesus saw the great multitudes about him, he gave a command to depart to the other side. Then a certain scribe came and said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. <laughs> and Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Then another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. So, backtracking. Jesus decided to leave the current location of Capernaum and he wanted to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is important to the story. So have that in the back of your mind, right? Jesus saw great multitudes about him. He gave a command to depart to the other side. Now, exactly who Jesus gave the command to is not abundantly clear from the text. But we can presume that it was at least Peter, James, John, and Andrew who are going to be part of this crew in this boat. Remember last week I said, next week we're going to look at Jesus going on a boat trip. We're not, going, we're not there just yet, but we're going to get there, right? So they were in this boat, part of the crew, at least then. But it says in verse 19 that before they could set sail to get on their journey, it says, then a certain scribe came and said to him, so this is a certain scribe, he's not mentioned by name, but he came to Jesus, and being a scribe, we know that he was a person of influence. Scribes were like the lawyers, because they were the ones who wrote down the scriptures. And because my dad used to always say to me, 
Once written, twice read. Once written, twice read. So you're writing it down. So as you're writing it down, you're, you're reading it twice. But he's, that's his job. He's writing it down. So you're familiar with the law, right? Scribes. And so being a scribe, you know, we, we, we know that he was a person of influence. And we're assuming that this scribe had obviously been listening intently to the Lord's teachings. And so he was impressed by Jesus. So much so that he says, teacher. Okay, that's a good thing, right? He's showing respect to Jesus. He's calling him teacher. And he continues and he says, I will follow you wherever you go. Big talk, right? The scribe was basically saying, I want to be committed to you, Jesus. I want to follow you. And he adds, wherever you go. And it all sounds nice. And it made me think that generally, when we hear someone say something like this, like, I want to follow you, Jesus. I want to give my life to you, Lord. We all get happy. We all get gassed. Because someone's decided to follow Jesus. Someone's decided to come to church. We're so happy. Cha-ching. It's like, yay. But listen to Jesus' response. Jesus doesn't get gassed. Jesus isn't so quick to get all happy, 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 happy. Because someone's decided, oh, they're going to come to church today. Because somebody says, I want to follow Jesus. Talk is cheap. Don't talk the talk if you're not prepared to. It's a rose, that's another one for you. <laughs> Sorry, my G. Jesus isn't so quick to be all happy, happy, happy. Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. And it's like, Jesus, that's just random. What does that mean? I mean, am I the only one who re read that and thought, Jesus, what does that mean? Like, what are you talking about? You all are, all are students of the word, so you guys know, I know, I just had to study it. Foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. So Jesus responds with, to describe by using a, a Jewish idiom, which means that the basic comforts which anyone has in life, like shelter, foxes, guess what? They have holes for shelter. Birds of the air, they have nests for shelter because this earthly environment was created for foxes to have holes, birds to have nests. But the son of man, the earth was not his natural environment. It's not his natural environment. Jesus was on mission in planet earth it's a bit like heaven is my throne and the earth is my my footstool i wasn't i'm not out here and have, and earth is my ho and the earth is my home it's my unnatural environment the son of man and he says the son of man it's the first time we see the son of man be jesus using that for himself and the son of man is a reference to daniel i think it's daniel chapter seven right son of man so you know, son of man, Jesus, it's like he was his favorite messianic name for himself, he used for himself. And he says, the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Now, the word lay here is clino, not crino, <laughs> clino. It's a very interesting word, clino, because... It means to lay or to bow, to rest. It means that, right? 
And the only other time that this word klino is used with reference to Jesus is when the Lord klino, no, klino his head and gave up the spirit on the cross. Very interesting. The earth wasn't his natural environment. But when he was going to be within his natural environment, if I can say it like that without being heretical, he bowed his head. You see it there? Did you catch that? And so Jesus didn't have a home of his own. Jesus didn't own property. As I said, his life and mission didn't afford these earthly luxuries. And so he's saying that if anyone desired to follow him, they will not be guaranteed these basic needs either. It's not a guarantee. You may have it, you may not have it. It's not a guarantee. And so Jesus looked at the real issue of this man's heart because Jesus can do stuff like that. You can look at your heart and know exactly what motivates you, what you're really all about. We can fool each other, but you can't fool the Lord, right? And he knew that for this certain scribe, he was being too fast in making a decision about Jesus. You're being too fast. And Jesus could look at his life and he knew that the scribe basically looked at his own life and thought, I have all I need. I have all my comforts. I have position, power, wealth, respect. And now I have a great teacher who I can listen to and follow. And it's like Jesus was just another thing he added on to his list. And what the scribe should have seen is that to follow Christ was the greatest comfort he could ever give to his soul. But he didn't see it. So Jesus looked at this particular, this certain scribe, and he saw that he was flaky. Jesus knew that he would be like seed sown upon stony ground. So Jesus put it on him. Jesus put it on him and tells him, you're not serious. You're not ready to count the cost to be my disciple. It's a bit like when Jesus said to, to the disciples, unless you eat my flesh and, and drink my blood, guess what? You can have no part of me. And it says, many departed from him on that day. Even the disciples are like, well, the, the, the 12 are like, wow, that's a bit hard. That's a hard saying. You know, we're not cannibals around here. <laughs> Jesus put it on him. And as I said, it's like sometimes within the church, we're a bit too happy, happy, happy because someone decides, they've decided to come to church one week. And I'm not saying we're not happy. I'm not trying to say that. I'm just trying to say that, you know what? The race is not for the swift. It's those who endure to the end, isn't it? It's he or she who overcomes. It's the long haul. So Jesus says to him, you're not serious. You're not ready to count the cost to be my disciple. And the text doesn't say it. But the general consensus is that he chose not to follow Jesus. And the general consensus is because nothing else is mentioned about him within the scriptures. And so the scribe was too hasty. But then, you know, Matthew describes someone else. The next guy is contrasted with him because without him being too hasty, this guy's going to be too slow. He says, then an, another of his disciples said to him, before we go on to what he said to him, I've got to pick up on the word disciples. Now, the word disciples is a very loose word. 
because it can mean a number of things. To be a disciple can be someone who just listens to the teachings of someone else. You just listen. Many of you, without realizing it, if you listen to whoever it is, go to teacher, you're one of the disciples, right? You listen to them. But then you can be a disciple who's a bit more committed because you listen and you kind of like, you know, act out some of the things what they're actually saying. So you're still a disciple, but you're a bit more of a committed disciple. The same word's going to be used for you within the scriptures. And then you've got a disciples who are like, okay, just think of the, the 11. Disciples. And so when we read, and another of his disciples, I mean, just know that's a very broad term. I'm just trying to highlight that, yeah? And we've got to think about it because, you know, we've got to, you know, figure out what type of, which one do we fit into when I say these things. I mean, think about it. The 11 were disciples, but Judas was a disciple also, you know. We know that there was 500 plus people who saw Jesus after the resurrection. Disciples. Okay, so... It's an interesting word. And so it says, then another of his disciples said to him, Lord. So again, like the first guy, like the certain scribe, he's also being respectful, maybe a bit more respectful because he's not saying teacher, rabbi, rabboni. He says, Lord, kurios. Let, let me first go and, and bury my father. And, you know, we read this, and obviously, when we read this, you know, if, if a parent dies, then a child is expected to, to bury their parent, right? And within Jewish culture, children were expected to bury their parents and to mourn for them for up to 30 days. And then after 30 days, they're expected to, to get, on, get on with life. But the problem here was that this disciple's father was not dead. So he's not referring to, let me go and bury my father. I've got this 30-day period where I've got to mourn for him. He's not, he's, he's not saying that. This disciple basically was waiting for his father to die. He was using another Jewish idiom. He was waiting for his father to die so that he could receive his inheritance. So, this could have taken years, right? And so he says, let me first bury my father. And so Jesus, I don't know, I don't know how Jesus looked at him, but like, Jesus, I don't know if Jesus scratched his head like, are you for real, bro? Like, for real? Have you not been listening to the Sermon on the Mount around here? I know what Jesus, how he looked at him, but I would have scratched my head. That's, that's why I'm not Jesus. I just said, bruv, come on now, keep it moving. But I'm not Jesus. I'm not Jesus. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but Jesus knew what he was saying. And this is how Jesus is just heavy. I think he's heavy anyway. Because Jesus doesn't take both barrels and just go, like probably I would. Jesus kept the invitation open to the guy. Jesus says to him, answer, 22, follow me. He's heard what this guy's had to say. He could have said, are you, as I said, are you, are you for real? Are you a joker? No, he said to him, follow me. Keeps the invitation open. You know, and I, I, I suppose he says this to challenge him to see if he is actually willing to pay the price of true discipleship. Are you willing to pay that price? So, so Jesus said to him, you've obviously been listening to some of my stuff. You're, you obviously can see that there's something different about me. You're probably impressed by me, right? Now, I want to give you an opportunity, this very thing you see in me, to declare it to others. Because, I say this because in Luke's account, it says, Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you, you go and preach the kingdom of God. That's what he says. That's the bigger picture. 
So Jesus is like, I've got a mission for you, for you to go and preach the kingdom. But you're telling me about, you've got to bury your father. Okay. And that's why he says, but you go your way. So Jesus is saying to him, follow me. Basically, follow me when he says, let the dead bury the dead. He says, basically, follow me and don't get hung up around basically waiting for, what's he waiting for? He's waiting for death. You're waiting for death. Waiting for your father to die. That's what you're waiting for. I mean, come on. Why not be about the business of declaring life instead of waiting for death? Let the dead bury their own dead. Let the spiritually dead bury the physical dead. Let natural things deal with and take care of natural things. But you, you come and preach life. That was the challenge he set before him. In Luke's account, it continues to say, and another also said, Lord, what's that word? Curios. Lord, I will follow you. But let me, no, sorry, yeah, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and starts doing this looking back stuff is fit for the kingdom. You see, as I said, Jesus doesn't get gassed when somebody starts having this long talk about, I want to follow Jesus, I love Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. Because he knows it's the long haul. It's the long haul. And, you know, what Jesus says, you know, could be, can be considered as being harsh, harsh responses to describe and harsh responses to the disciple. But Jesus is only setting the bar where it should be. Where it should be. Because he wants to make sure that those who come to him know what true discipleship entails. And that they have counted the cost. No man goes to war without first, maybe Putin didn't count the cost, right? <laughs> says no one going to war, no one goes to war without first counting the cost. And, you know, I, I, I suppose Jesus, he kind of like sets the, the bar high because, you know, Jesus is not going to take any pleasure in saying on that future day. We speak about that a lot, right? I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Jesus isn't going to take pleasure in saying that. Because people said, I love you, Lord, I follow you. Really? Show me the evidence. So Jesus is looking for full surrender. He says, let the physical dead, those who have no interest in salvation, let them bury their own dead. Let the circular world take care of its own business. But you, you have generally answered to, genuinely answered to the call. You follow me. <clears throat> and again, the general consensus, that this man also went away, you know, went on his way because we do not read in the next verse and he left all to follow Christ. And so after this, and this is me reading into the text. This isn't the text. I kind of like, I can almost hear Jesus, and this is me, not the text, saying, okay, are we done? Are we done with all you guys who are going to say you're going to follow me, right? We done out here. Because I'm about to go on a journey to the other side. And the thing is, when we look at what happens in the journey on the other side, you pretty much needed to be serious whether you wanted to follow Jesus or not. And 
Jesus is almost saying, I don't want you to be either too fast to make a decision about me, too slow to make a decision about me. Just be right on time. Weigh it up properly. Because in chapter 10, we're not going to be at chapter 10 for a while. Chapter 10, Jesus says, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemy, enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow me after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. He who receives you, guess what? Receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. You see, powerful. But Jesus is putting a line in the sand. The line's there. You can... The invitation goes out to whosoever will, right? But there's a, there's a cost. Verses go on to say, he receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a, di a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. So Jesus kind of like throws in, look, there's rewards to be gained at the end of it. We don't do it for the rewards, but faithfulness produces rewards. Not where rust and moth can destroy it, but eternal rewards, right? So again, I'm saying Jesus sets the bar not high, but at the right place. And again, because as we will see, those who choose to continue follow Jesus on that particular day would experience a storm. So we're going to get to the boat trip soon, right? will experience a storm, and again, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record this story. God likes repetition, right? And if he hits something once, twice, three times, there's a clue, right? He wants you to listen. So, and also the scripture says that the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a matter be established, right? So, what does this story tell us about? It tells us that believers will go through storms. We're either going into one, going through one, or just coming out of one. Storms. But we have to remember, I said it at the very beginning, right? Verse 18. What was the command? The command was, let's go to the other side. That's the command, right? You following? Yeah. Say amen, because I want to know you're with me. Amen. That wasn't a strong amen. One more time. Amen. All right, cool. I feel a bit better now. I know it's not about me, but I do feel a bit better. So it says, verse 23, now when he got into a boat. So here's the boat trip. His disciples the ones who thought that they could hack it, right? Not too slow, not too fast. They followed him. And as they journeyed to the other side, we got to have in our minds that they journeyed to the other side in obedience. They're in obedience. It's not disobedience, it's obedience. I've given you the command, we're going where? Right, they're in obedience, right? And there would have been sort of like small boats following the Lord's boat to the other side. And it says, verse 24, and suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with the waves. So this was a bad storm. 
And if anybody's been on a boat trip when there's been a bad storm and it's... No? Okay. That's a good choice. <laughs> That's a good choice. <coughs> but yeah. So you, you have to imagine it. And just to say as well that... Anybody been to Israel? No? Okay. But the Sea of Galilee, you know, which is roughly... 13 miles long and 8 miles wide. And it's not really a sea, but they call it a sea because it's huge, right? And it was not uncommon on the Sea of Galilee for, um, for storms just to come out of nowhere. You know, and I think it's got something to do with the geographical location because there's mountains on either side. And when the snow and everything sort of like melted from the mountains, depending on the weather conditions and everything, came down and filled the sea. And you had the different winds coming from that way and wind... You get the picture? It's like it created like psh, out of nowhere. One minute it would be calm, next minute psh, out of nowhere. And so they're leaving, everybody's happy, they're going from one side, of, I've got to set it up, going from one side to the other side, and then once they're in the middle, I don't know exactly how far they've gone in, this great storm just picks up. And it's crazy. And we look at this great storm, and even though I just said because of its geographical location, it was unusual for storms to arise. I think when we read this, most people would see some type of demonic activity in there, right? I mean, it's a bit like the whole Job thing. Job, like one minute, he's ha everything's all right, and then the whirlwind comes and smashes up everything, and then his children are taken out, and craziness is going on. Still with the same crowd, right? Amen. Cool. So this, this tempest arose. But Jesus is fast asleep. He's in the boat. He's going on a boat trip. He wasn't into the sights. Oh, look at that. He's, he's chilling. He's sleeping in the boat. And the lovely thing about this is that when we see Jesus chilling in the boat, we see his humanity. The guy's been up all night <laughs> casting out demons, healing the sick. Healing Peter's mother-in-law and everything. He's, this, he's that every, All that came to him, guess what? He healed them. So he's, he's tired. He's tired. 100% God? 100% man. He's tired. I'm chilling in the boat at the back. Leave me alone. I know it's some R&R &R around there. And so, I mean, I could have kind of like merged the different accounts, but it's like, look. We'll never get through Matthew if I keep doing things like Then his disciples came to him and awoke him like, Jesus, Jesus, I'm reading it again, like, Lord, save us. You've got an exclamation mark there, right? <laughs> We're perishing. <laughs> and it's just, it's just funny because, because Peter, Andrew, James and John, what was their profession? What was their trade? Fishermen. Fishermen. <laughs> it's your boat. It's probably your boat. <laughs> and you're waking up a carpenter <laughs> to help you in a storm on a sea which you're used to because you fish in that sea. Lord. Save us! We're perishing! I find it funny. I mean, this is what we're like as Christians. They're in a storm. But yesterday, probably it was yesterday, did you just see Jesus cast that demon with a word? Demons were, did you just see him heal everyone you brought to him? You're in a storm now and it's like, Save us. We're perishing. And that's what we're like. Jesus will do something in our life today. Tomorrow we forget about it. We want the next thing for Jesus to do to us, for us. Forget about the things which he's done for us in the past. And that's why Jesus, that's why Yahweh used to always say, put down a couple of stones over there, memorial stones. So when you look at those stones, you remember what I did, right? Remember to have these feasts every year because these feasts celebrate what happened back then. I want to, you to re remember what happened back then. See, we forget about the most milestones in our life. 
what have you done for me lately, Jesus? That's the attitude we do have as believers. And it's, and it's not right. And so, they must, they've forgotten about the leper. They forgot about speaking the word to the centurion's servant. They forgot about Peter's mother. They forgot about all those people, the demons being cast out. Because as far as they were, in concern, they were concerned, they were in desperation. And in times of desperation, it will reveal exactly what type of relationship you and I have with Jesus. Just let me put you in a situation. Just let the Lord put me in a situation. And then we will see what we're made of. Do we really believe in this stuff? Or is it, yeah, I believe the Bible says, but the Lord doesn't know my situation. The Lord doesn't understand what I'm going through. Oh, really? Really? I remember having a conversation with a parent here one time, and I said, like, we was talking about something. I said, you believe God's word is true? Yeah. Reliable? Yeah. Okay, cool. But what about God's word says this? Oh, yeah, 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 but you can't use that. And I was like, but we just agreed that God's word was true and reliable. And they was like, no, 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 no. I can't remember the context, but I just thought, you can't have this wishy-washy approach to the word. It either is true or it's not true. And if it's not true, keep it moving, do your thing. But if it is true... The kingdom of God has come upon us. <laughs> Hallelujah. So Jesus said, verse 26. But he said to them, why are you fearful? In a way, it's like, don't you remember verse 18? They did have verses. In them. You get the gist, right? I gave the command... To depart, to go to the other side. And so Jesus was basically, you know, we, I say this all the time. Jesus doesn't promise us an easy journey through life. He doesn't. But what he does promise is that he will get us to the other side. When this life in this body is over, guess who gets us to, through the other side? That's Jesus. No matter what we experience in this body. And so you may have, you know, you know, you may have storms going on in your life. You, there may be a great tempest that may have arisen in your life, but the one who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Guess what that means? I will never leave you nor forsake you. He promises to get us to the other side and as I said they were not in this particular storm because of disobedience they were in this particular storm because of obedience so whatever you're going through isn't necessarily because you did anything wrong the Lord has just presented this at your at your feet this so happens to be what I presented to you in your life can you handle it Will you forsake me or will you continue with me? They were in this situation through obedience, not disobedience. And we think of Jonah, right? Jonah was in disobedience. You don't have to be. They were not in disobedience, in obedience. And Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. And so here we got this powerful thing where Matthew is contrasting the disciples with little faith and the centurion with great faith he's contrasting it and he wants his disciples to grow in faith so that they would then have great faith so it says in jesus i don't know how he did it i don't know if it was the michael it was robert powell thing where it's I don't know. But Jesus, he says, he arose. So basically, he was reclining. And like, what? What are you doing? <laughs> I was having a good sleep there, you know. <laughs> and then he arose. Hallelujah. He arose. 
and he rebuked the winds and the sea. He rebuked the winds and the sea. I've got to repeat it with the clipping of my fingers. He rebuked the wind and the sea, and there was great calm. Mark says, then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. It's like hush, silence. Now, as I was thinking about this, and I was actually speaking to someone, again, at work about this, and they was like, oh, that never happened. And I says, well, that's the great miracle about it. But when you have a bath and you kind of like, you know, you swish the bath, the, the momentum is like, it's like that, isn't it? You don't just now put your hand in and go, Shh, and it stops. Do you? The momentum keeps it. Yeah? Jesus rebukes the wind, rebukes the sea. That's the best I can do. <laughs> It's calm. Isn't there meant to be a little sort of like after? It's like wave, the swimming pool thing. You know when you go to the wave thing, you know, all right, I got one, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> you know the wave thing when you go to the swimming pool, it's got the wave thing, right? And it starts off and it's slow and it, and it gets rough and everything. And then once they turn off the, wing, 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 and the sound goes off. I've been there, yeah. <laughs> Set the parts. Then it's a lot after a little while. But it's after a little while, right? Gradual. Not here. Not here. <laughs> With my Lord. I'm in. <laughs> Not here. Hush. Silence. The wind stopped. The waves stopped. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> and so, I say that to say, whatever storms you may be going through right now, and it may be turbulent. Jesus could just say, hush, be still. Done. It's not now I have to go through all this drama to get out of it. Maybe just done. Because Jesus is good like that. He's big like that. And so all this, all these things was demonstrating that Jesus has power. You can't be a king and you don't have any power. I've got power over the demonic realm. I could say to those demons, you know what, get out. And they had to get out. I've got power over sickness and disease. Be healed. I don't have to touch you. I can send the word. I've got power over nature, the natural elements. Wind, stop. See, be still. And it is so. power <laughs> and so Matthew in verse 27 says so men marveled <laughs> the men marveled saying who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him what kind of man because <laughs> this is more than a man you know what kind of man can this be Mark's account says and they feared exceedingly. I like that word exceedingly. They feared, they didn't just fear. They feared exceedingly and said to one another, they're not even saying it to him, you know, they're like, who could this be? Like, he just done. Did you see that? I saw it. And they feared. They were more afraid of Jesus than being in that storm. Because they realized, oh my goodness. We saw Jesus do stuff, but he's just done stuff. <laughs> he's done stuff. Who could this be? And so, basically, they were like, oh my goodness. This is a bit scary. Not scary bad, scary good. But they feared exceedingly. So, 
in closing, just to reiterate, you know, Jesus is always looking for true disciples. He doesn't want us to be too fast, too slow. He wants us to really count the cost. He's the only one with the words of life. So ultimately, you can't really go anywhere else. But it's a choice which everyone has to make for themselves. And as we journey through life, we make that choice to follow Jesus and we journey through life, then we're not guaranteed that everything would just be, that saying, a bed of roses. I mean, I don't even know what that saying means, but roses look beautiful, right? But the, the stems are all prickly, right? So life is, what does that mean? I thought someone could tell me afterwards. So life is beautiful, but it has its pricks, right? Because if you if you get picked by one of those roses, they hurt. They hurt. Yeah. I know what I meant there. But anyway, we may go through storms. It's more likely that we will go through storms than not go through storms. And... We may be going through storms, not through disobedience, because the Lord indeed led us into that storm. Because he wants to produce character. He's more interested in our character than he is in our comfort. You know, but again, not to go too far into this, but modern Christianity is more, is more interested in comfort than character. And so whatever situation we may be going through, just know... Jesus is not sleeping. He's not asleep. And even if he is asleep, he's in control. He's in control. And he will bring calm. In the desired time, <clears throat> which is appointed for you, he will bring that calm into your life, into my life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Shall we pray? Father, we want to thank you for your word. Thank you for the encouragement in the word. Thank you, Lord, just to see the demonstration of your power, which was witnessed by your disciples, Lord, and we believe their word to be true. And Lord, I mean, on one hand, it probably would have been fearful to go through that experience with you, Lord, but then to see the way you just calm the wind and calm the sea was, must have been amazing. But Lord, you, you, you do those things in our lives, even today. You bring calm. And we thank you for that calm, Lord. And so be with us, Lord, as we go through this week. I pray, Lord, that we're able to use this word as a springboard, Lord, as encouragement. And, um, and to lift up your name and maybe be able to share it with others, Lord, so that you will be lifted up and you will be glorified. So we thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.